Hello, this is Professor Busui Booth, and this is part two of our week three and week four wrap up. In this installation, I'm going to focus in on chapter three, business in a borderless world. First, let's have some definitions. And in this case, international trade is defined as buying, selling, and trading of goods and services across national boundaries. Pretty simple enough. And that 95% of the world's population, or two thirds of the total purchasing power, is outside of the United States. That's going to be fairly important for us to remember. And that as differences among nations lessen in terms of you know, political, economic, social, environmental factors, uh, globalization increases. And that as tech advances, and when we talk about technology in this case, we're talking about digitization and the internet which makes it easier to access markets without even leaving you know, your national boundaries. Um, so for example, you could have e-commerce and sell to China or South America or Australia without actually having brick and mortar stores in those nations. All right, let's vis revisit or at least think about why nations trade in the first place. So we'll need to have a quick look back in history. All right, so some of the origins, um, as you might suspect, is because there were scarce resources, right? And then people needed to exchange their goods and services. You know, you have tomatoes, I have potatoes, let's exchange. And, um, and it was for economic gain, because maybe I could sell your tomatoes, or you could sell my potatoes. And it was also to increase our quality of life, right? And over time, we needed a way to have to exchange our goods using a durable currency, and um, that led to the invention of paper money, which was first used in China, because merchants and wholesalers there did not want to carry these heavy, you know, copper coins, so they started using money. And during this time, people actually went to war to get their goods, and uh, realized that this was incredibly, incredibly costly. And perhaps you should think of other ways to acquire goods. And so in 1860, for example, Napoleon III negotiated the Cobden Chevalier Treaty or Free Trade Trade Agreement, and we will sometimes refer to them as FTAs here, between France and Britain. Okay, because they were at war with Britain. And that, you know, during this deliberation, an argument was that opening markets would reduce domestic labor. So that was one side of the argument. And then an argument for this free trade agreement was that it would tend to increase rather than diminish the demand for labor because you're opening up markets. And if we especially address tariff reforms, tariff is sort of taxes, particularly in imports. So when goods come into the country, a tax can sometimes be put on them to protect their, the goods that are made in the country. Okay. And so they said here that if we especially address that, you know, you would tend to open up our markets and increase the demand for labor. But Napoleon, in his wisdom, would say, but it is very difficult in France to make reforms. We make revolutions instead in France, not reforms. But he ultimately saw, you know, sort of the, the wisdom of this and signed a treaty to make Britain an ally and to avert war because in, it was very, very costly, you know, to go down that route. And so they had peace on the land, in the land. And the effect was that the British exports to France more than doubled, all right, in, in the 1860s. And the French imports of French wines into Britain also doubled. And so the French wines now were being um, consumed outside of French borders, and they were making money for it. And a little bit more on the history of trade. Um, uh, 1944, uh, the Britain Woods system, an international economic model, uh, was developed to stop wars and depressions. So this was at the heels of World War II, and you know the 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 powers that be just thought, you know, we can't have keep having these wars, and you know cycles of depressions because they're incredibly costly, not just in human lives, but just you know the the vitality of our economies. And so they adopted rules, institutions, and procedures to regulate this idea of of an international monetary system so that it, when people would actually start, nations would actually start uh, exchanging goods, you know, there was a way to sort of manage the money that was crossing borders. And so they created the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and eventually the World Bank. 
and they pegged their currencies to the price of gold. So in order to understand what the, the value of money is, you got to peg it to something. And in this case, they used the price of gold as a way to determine the value of the different currencies and that it would be convertible, right? So uh, nations could say, you know, given my exchange rate, your, your ruble is worth this many dollars. So uh, countries had to adopt not only a monetary policy, but also exchange rates. And that the US dollar was set um, as linked to the price of gold. And interestingly, then the US controlled two thirds of the world's gold. But the dollar got really strong and then decided that it was no longer going to be pegged to the, to the gold. And this led to the collapse of the gold system in 1973. And the US then, the dollar became the reserve currency. And what that means is that nations will convert their own dollars or buy you, uh, their own money, their own currency, buy or, or, or buy US dollars and hold on to them as a safe haven currency because they saw the US dollar as far more stable and something that they could actually count on. All right. So in 1947, 23 nations agree to implement the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and this is on the same vein. Um, the idea that you know we need to boost our econ uh, um, our economies, uh, especially after World War II, which disseminate, disseminated, excuse me, decimated all kinds of industries, and it was also meant to increase international trade by reducing or eliminating trade barriers like tariffs, quotas, and subsidies. And uh, while having, you know, meaningful rules that people could follow. And then in 1995, um, uh, fast forward, because this effort to have sort of some rules around trade continues, uh, the World Trade Organization came about. And they are, it is now the institution that governs or sort of determines the rules of trade between nations. All right. And so today, globalization has degrees of engagement. Uh, the lowest is the idea of exporting, all right? So you can um, you just make something from where you are in your nation and then export it to another nation, right? And um, you could also be anywhere in between uh, exporting and be a national corporation and, and do trading companies. You could do licensing and contract manufacturing arrangements, outsourcing, direct investment, joint ventures, and the like. And let me just go over what some of those are, right? So licensing is a trade arrangement. And so the licensor allows a licensee to use the company assets like company name, the products, the patents, the brands, the trademarks, that sort of thing, and exchange for a fee or royalty. That's licensing, right? So Nike can go, or excuse me, like Disney can uh, license Cinderella or, or something like that. And then uh, franchising is a little bit different. It is a form of licensing, but the franchisor has a tighter control over the activities of the franchisee. So for example, McDonald's is a franchisor and can uh, you know, sort of sell its business model to a franchisee in China. And so the, that franchisee receives a package support and business model is ready to go. Like it's a business in a box and his name, logo, methods of operation, the like. And you know, sort of the marketing power and name recognition of McDonald's in this in, in case. And in exchange, your present franchisor um, receives financial commitment, so some percentage of um, what you know the franchisee makes, and also control over how the business is conducted. So it remains a, a, a packaged business model that can be replicated across, uh, in this case, the world. Okay, and so licensing and franchising are common in the sense that they both lower costs of business development by involving third parties in opening and managing new facilities. So it's very much a very structured arrangement. Okay. So a contract manufacturing, what that is, is when a foreign company produces, you know, a specified volume of firms product to specs. So say I want to make a toy. And so I, you know, I'd like to go and have it made um, in India. And so, um, you know, it's it's made over there, and it uses you know domestic firm's name on the on the final products. So that's contract manufacturing, and um, it enables a company to benefit from the lower production costs offered in the foreign country without investing in that country. So it's kind of a 
a way to make money without putting a lot of money in the country where um, you're using their services. Okay. Outsourcing is a little bit different, and it's a transferring of you know specific sets of tasks such as you know, production or data entry. Um, you can imagine call centers are, are are of this nature to countries where labor or supplies are less expensive. Right. So it's controversial in the U.S. and because it does move jobs overseas. Again, an example of that would be call centers. And however. A stack advances and it is advancing and it becomes more efficient and the overseas cost to have these call centers increase because there is actually a rise of, of certain nations middle class you know so the people um, in other nations are moving up their economic chain that cost for labor there is increasingly getting expensive the jobs are moving back to the US so some call centers are actually coming back to the US all right. So balance of trade then is this idea of the difference between a nation's exports and imports. And um, in this case, if the U.S. imports uh, imports more, so brings in more goods from other nations uh, than it exports, and then we have a trade deficit. And here's the equation for that. So exports, so the U.S. exports, you know, cars, and then there are imports and then other nations that may import their cars. And then um, depending on who imported more or exported more, you have a surplus or deficit of trade. And the U.S. trade deficit is often talked about. So uh, this is in your book, and I went ahead and um, uh, had it reproduced here. And this is between 1990 and 2014. There are billions of dollars, and this is a trade deficit against China. And the data is from the uh, census, uh, U.S. Uh, US census. And so, as you can see here, the exports—that's how much you know in total of all goods that we export across, uh, you know, from two um, uh, uh, two thousand. Excuse me, that should be uh, two thousand, not nineteen ninety, to twenty fourteen. And then you can see what's the imported, and then what. A trade surplus or deficit would look like okay and this is a little misleading though because it isn't really clear if you look if you looked at this you say oh that's bad for us but is it really okay all right so let's talk about the effects of the strong dollar so first of all currencies are used to buy goods and services across borders right so we have dollars rubles um, euro and the like to buy goods across borders and then the strength of a currency however strong a currency is it can affect the ability of how much that can be that can buy how much it can you know what it can what it can get and um, in the case of the United States when we have a strong dollar uh, there's more consumer spending in the US so we buy more imports because our dollar can simply buy more and that uh, it also, um, you know, because the, the relative to our dollar, the cost of imports will be less. So the, the math there is basically because our dollar can buy more um, of things that cost less, we have more disposable income. And that is good since consumer spending accounts for 70% of our economy. So it actually that money uh, fuels the economic engine when our dollar is strong. And so, but the effects are different across industries. So it's good for hospitality industry, for example, because, you know, we'll go out and eat and that sort of thing um, in our own, uh, within our own borders. But it's not so good for tourism because um, when other countries come into, when other folks come uh, from other countries come to our nation to go, uh, you know, because of tourism, their doll, their currency doesn't buy as much so they may choose to travel elsewhere they're sort of when the dollar is really strong and they have only so much money to go and you know tour the united states they might choose to delay that trip go someplace else or their particular currency can take them further okay so uh, the effects of the strong dollar can be good or bad depending on which part of that equation you're looking at 
and uh, but it can tip the balance of trade. So U.S. exports become more expensive, right? So when our dollars are strong, are it becomes more expensive for other, you know, for people outside the United States to buy our stuff. So it's bad for our balance of trade. And so um, what that will look like is that is that uh, you know. Um, it, it, it basically doesn't look good on the books in that case, but there are all kinds of trade balances that we have, manufacturing trade balances and services, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the bottom line is that a strong dollar has a negative impact on multinationals because they're the ones crossing borders and they need to go look for markets. And if the dollar is really strong, then in the open market, they'll get less customers. And it's uh, so it's therefore bad for our manufacturing and for those who produce uh, resources, okay? And so there are national trade barriers also, and I'll go on this very quickly. Uh, there are economic factors um, when we talk about international trade barriers, and a lot of that can be summed in the idea of undeveloped infrastructure, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. So, for example, if we go into nations that do not have developed roads, it becomes very inefficient to deliver goods and services. And so a lot of times when a multinational goes into a country like say Vietnam, who is not as developed than say the United States and the and US company, companies want to go into Vietnam in order to penetrate the market, get their brand recognition. So people start to learn about, you know, the kinds of goods that, um, you know, they, they should start thinking about getting. Um, it becomes very expensive to deliver that because there's no, the, you know, the roads may not be as developed. And so the nation, Vietnam, may say, we'll let you do, we'll have you come into our markets, because not in, you can't just go into a country and say, oh, I'm going to start selling. You actually have to have permission to do that. A nation might say, yeah, okay, you can come, but you have to help us develop our roads. You know, we're opening our markets up to you, so you're going to have to help us uh, um, develop our roads. So in that sense, it becomes a win-win situation. Uh, and early enter in the market, entry into a market is actually highly uh, a, a good determinant of how well a company will over, do over the long term. Okay, and then there are also exchange rates. Again, it's the ratio at which one nation's currency can be exchanged for another. And uh, we just discussed import and export impacts. And so it just really depends on you know what part of the equation you might be uh, in. And then there are issues around currency manipulation. And so this is when a nation, for example, will devalue, will lower the value of their, of their currency. So if we were to do it here in the United States, our strong dollar becomes a weak dollar, and that's to lower the cost of goods abroad so that we can reach more markets and encourage the sale of domestic goods um, abroad and encourages tourism inside our borders. So that's how that one works. And um, there are other barriers, ethical, legal, and political, and laws and regulations on labor, uh, international, financial taxes. So, for example, multinationals here in the United States, they have to abide by I laws, um, regardless of whether they are having a business done elsewhere. Um, U.S. companies still have to abide by our laws. And so um, our goods will still have to be produced under certain environmental regulations, whereas we're competing perhaps with other countries who may not have those kinds of standards, okay? And then um, tariffs and trade restrictions to control flow of goods uh, and impact on domestic economy and industries. So this is a, a hot topic right now because there's a lot of talk about trade uh, and tariffs. And the thing to understand there is that once a nation starts talking about putting taxes on certain goods, it encourages another country to say, well, if you're gonna put taxes on our goods coming into your country, we'll put taxes on your goods coming into our country. And it starts to have this trade war effect and one has to wonder whether that, that was really um, the, the, the net effect that you were going for because a, a, a tariff is really a tax on goods and it just, that gets just passed on to consumers. That, you know, that does not get absorbed by the manufacturer it just gets passed on to consumers. So a trade war is actually very expensive for, uh, for the end consumer, okay? And then there are also political instability. Um, 
which can lead to economic sanctions and hostility and you know friendliness depending who's in charge so uh it's um it's very difficult to do trade when a nation is unstable so one of the things that you're hearing right now for example is north korea has um i mean it does have an economy of some some sort but it's going through economic sanctions and uh it's acting very unstable at the moment and um, if something actually happened within north korea there could be spillage outside uh, out of north korea so there would be you know people uh, crossing boundaries just to get out of whatever you know might be happening in north korea and that does affect trade um, because the, the industries that are currently in, in North Korea and the nations that are dependent on those industries would be disrupted, for example. And then this is also true in all kinds of nations where we have economic sanctions. Um, we have economic sanctions in Russia, for example. Okay. And um, this is a little bit of a repeat, but the, the social and cultural uh, barriers are, are many. And so we have to be very cognizant of customs, religious and otherwise, so that uh, we don't inadvertently offend, you know, a culture because we're just transplanting our own values here in the United States, which may or may not be shared across borders. And then there are also linguistic um, challenges because how interpretations can be very tricky. And uh, again, that could result in offense and then not understanding how a culture will interpret that could make basically mean, you know, a go or no go on particular products and services. And that um, when, when multinationals go into nations and hire people and workers and or sell their products, they also have to understand um, association roles. And so, you know, how family members make decisions or the role of children that sort of thing. And then there are general norms, uh, particularly around time um, and other things too. But say, for example, in the United States, you know, we're a very time driven nation. But if we go into different parts of the world, um, it's that's not necessarily the case. You know, it's uh, when we say we will meet you at 12 o'clock noon, uh, that may not necessarily be what is being interpreted to others on the, the other end. It might mean actually more like 2, 2 p.m. Okay. And so this picture, this is really interesting, and this is more of an example of a misfire, cultural, linguistic, everything misfire. And this is a story about uh, the Gerber uh, brand and sold baby food in Africa using basically the same packaging used in the U.S. with, you know, the beautiful Caucasian baby on the label. And what happened was they later found out that in Africa, companies actually put pictures of the ingredients on the label since pe many people can't read. And so when uh, folks saw the Gerber baby, you know, baby food and they fought and they saw the Gerber baby on the label, a lot of them thought that, that the, the baby food was made out of babies. <laughs> so a complete fiasco. It cost them millions of dollars. Nobody bought you know, the Gerber baby food, and they had to repackage and, and, and sort of reintroduce the product, um, and they had to sort of earn people's trust all over again. So it's really, really, really important to understand, you know, the kinds of cultural, social norm barriers that may, may be present. Um, we can't just transplant what we think uh, works here and expect that it would work elsewhere. All right, and so other international trade barriers are around technology um, because it can also uh, sort of limit access to goods and services um, or the efficient and effective delivery of goods and services. But if there's actually a technological uh, uh, barrier there, it could be seen as an opportunity by introducing technological products in, in nations. So for example, there are nations who just basically have skipped the landlines and gone straight to smartphones because companies uh, went in there and installed their towers and then were able to sell all kinds of smartphones. People never even got to the landlines. They just skipped that little, um, that, that process altogether and went to smartphones. So it's very interesting. So it's kind of important to sort of revisit why nations trade again. And uh, it is the long arc of history. And then, uh, 
you know, the, um, this is a revisiting again of, of GATT and the World Trade Organization. And I bring this up again because this, the central need there was to boost, to have, you know, to have economic recovery as a result of wars, right? And then the using trade really as a way to um, increase world prosperity and integrate our interests so that we're less likely to go to war with each other. And that has been a goal within trade. It's not the only goal of trade, but it is a vision within this idea of international trade that as we move into a borderless world, we become more dependent on each other and less likely to have you know, bloody conflicts. All right. And so this has led to free trade agreements. So uh, the European Union, um, it was created uh, in the spirit and also the North, uh, you know, to create sort of an economic block. And uh, uh, the European countries have, of course, seen uh, several wars and got tired of it. And they said, look, you know, let, let's sort of uh, figure this out so that we don't find ourselves fighting each other again over limited resources. And then uh, NAFTA in 1993 um, was also around the idea of an economic block like the European Union so that we could open up our markets and become more integrated. And then again, uh, the World Trade Organization um, uh, sort of steps into this role to promote free trade between various nations because there can be disagreements about what how trade actually occurs. So they need sort of a... Um, a deliberating body that also enforces the rules. Okay, and um, I won't actually go uh, through this too much, but suffice it to say, the European Union was created again after uh, World War II to tie their fates, to create a political bloc, to create a single market so they could be cooperative and interdependent and ultimately avoid conflict. And that in order to do that, they needed a hard currency. Um, in this case, they agreed to something called the euro. To integrate the financial markets, okay, and uh, it has evolved from a purely economic union to a quasi-political, you know, addressing human rights, climate change, and the like. And NAFTA, I'll do this very quickly. The intent again was to bring prosperity through increased trade and production, and uh, the intent was to create millions of well-paying jobs in all participating countries: uh, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And the means to do that was to the elimination of most tariffs and other trade barriers uh, between these nations and to create a free trade bloc. And um, the criticisms, um, again, if this sort of reminds you of what Napoleon's time had to go and grapple with, is that you know, it would undermine local government's ability to issue laws around, and, and to protect public interests because NAFTA would be sort of the governing law in this case, and that it might degrade environmental and health standards, um, promote privatization and deregulation of key public services, and that uh, it would displace family farmers in, in those countries. And um, what actually happened was uh, it was a mixed bag. So in Mexico, there was a dramatic increase in exports, okay, from 60 billion to 400 billion. Uh, and there was also a surge of exports. So um, coming out of of, of Mexico and surge of imports. So it did open these markets and there was an influx of better quality, lower price goods for Mexican consumers. So they had greater choice. They were buying more American products, more Canadian products. And um, for the US and Canada, also a mixed bag. Um, we also experienced a great recession during this time. So the gains that we had from NAFTA was pretty much overshadowed by that. It was very hard to tell. And there was um, you know, immigration restrictions uh, in place, so the wage gap between Mexico and U.S. and Canada, you know, did not shrink at all, not really, not in any meaningful way, and there were very few changes in the job market in all the three countries. So, you know, the fears about it, it'll it'll feel like that in certain sectors because certain sectors were hit harder, but in general, uh, there were few uh, changes in job markets, and because of the lack of Mexican infrastructure, you know, that we're talking about roads and utilities and that sort of thing. Um, actually caused many U.S. Canadian firms not to invest directly in Mexico because it would have been too costly. To them, the cost-benefit analysis uh, showed that they were not going to make a lot of money out of that, so they just decided not to do it. And that there were no significant job losses in U.S. or Canada. Now, that can be debated because 
if you lost your job to NAFTA, it's going to seem like a lot. But lo jobs are lost and gain all the time. And relative to, you know, other job losses in this case. And again, there was a great recession that happened during this time. Um, if you kind of, you know, tried to uh, compare apples to apples, um, there were no significant jobs losses in U.S. or Canada. Okay. And there were no environmental disaster caused by the industrialization in Mexico. So those fears did not, you know, come into reality. And so now there are these arguments for international trade that in order for the U.S. economy to grow and the wages to increase, we need to sell our products and our, you know, our services to the 95% of the world population that is outside of the U.S. borders. And so here's the United States, about 320 million people here, and everyone else lives here. And right now, um, the global population is in the billions, right? Uh, seven and a half billion, something like that. And that 41 million American jobs, uh, three out of 10, depend on trade. So, you know, not to actually participate in trade or to like overnight not participate in that, we would lose 30% of our jobs. And manufacturing sector um, exports the most, really. And in 2014, that translates to one four, one point four trillion dollars. I mean, it's hard to imagine what one point four trillion dollars is. It is a lot. Okay. And so, and the exports of manufactured goods, so the goods that we actually export, um, support six million U.S. factory jobs, about roughly half of all manufacturing employment. So we're very much integrated into international trade. Uh, you know, remember that this has been going on for years and to try to extract ourselves from it entirely, you know, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense now. And so the number of Americans employed in manufacturing has declined, though, since its peak in 1979, because we are increasingly a service economy. And that having said that, um, we have a very productive farming industry and one in three acres of our farms is planted for exports. I mean, we are a resource rich country and we basically uh, provide a lot of the food for the rest of the world. And that 90%, 98% of the 300,000 US exporting companies are small and medium sized businesses. And they represent a third of the US merchandise exports. So a lot of, um, small medium sized businesses are already tied to international trade and that um, interestingly and this is not well discussed in the news is that the US is the world's largest exporter of services and it's some of uh, examples are listed here like banking energy services express delivery and the like as opposed to manufacturing the making of goods we are now the largest exporter of the delivery of services. Okay. And so, in fact, we have a trade surplus there. We export a lot more services. Anyone else? And um, so, the benefits of world imports, though, so that was talking about exports, is that many of you already know this is that we have access to products that we would not otherwise be, you know, be able to get. So, we have fresh fruit in the winter. And that it boosts our purchasing power of the American, uh, the average American household, about 10,000 annually. And that's because imports cost less. And so we can buy more. So it boosts our purchasing power. And that those company, um, uh, companies who use, you know, uh, you need intermediate goods uh, and have to buy them, they buy the imported uh, goods that are less costly. And so they acquire a lower cost, making them more competitive in the markets, in the world marketplace. Okay, because they're, they're reducing their costs. Okay, and so FTAs um, is, uh, so we're talking about free trade agreements because that's that, that um, the, quite a bit of discussion on free trade agreements now in the nation. And so let's be clear about what those really are. So free trade agreements, uh, we have them with about 20 countries and they represent 6% of the world's population, between five and 6% of the world's population outside of the US, only 6%, okay? And that our trade partners purchase nearly half of all our US exports, okay? And that the small economies we trade with, 
re actually are big markets for us for the United States. It's, we get a huge bang for our buck in the small economies we enter, like Vietnam or um, Thailand or you know South American countries in Brazil. They become big markets for us because they're they're um, they're just growing markets. There's a lot of opportunity and potential there. And our manufactured goods actually ran a cumulative trade surplus between 2008 and 2015, according to the U.S. Department of Commerce. Okay, so things don't really look as bad as it might sound. That you know what you were maybe hearing in the news today, or lately, and that uh, again we have global trade surpluses in services and agricultural products. I mean, we are way above um, other trade partners. All right. And that, in fact, and this is interesting, and it's important for us to sit with this for a little bit, is that the U.S. trade deficit actually arises from trade in manufactured goods with countries where we have no trade agreement in place. Okay. Our trade deficit is really because we do not have an FTA in place. Because there are so managing globalization is a complex endeavor, right? Uh, generally speaking, though, the political barriers are generally falling, which leads to many opportunities in the 95% of the world outside of the US, many of which are small markets that can give our US companies big returns. And that can also translate some more jobs here in the United States, just as it had happened in other you know, trade situations. Um, however, our globalization challenges today are very complex. And so among them are to try to understand, you know, sort of economic factors like exchange rates, um, you know, the imports and exports and whether or not a strong dollar is actually going to be good for us or not. And that the myriad of barriers and other challenges that nations will face, and particularly for our country, globalization um, is a hotly debated topic because of how it ultimately affects jobs here at home. And it's important to remember, though, that the old trade motivations are still today's trade motivations. You know, the idea of opening markets so that we can have access to scarce goods, to have economic gain, and to improve our quality of life, and to, uh, but to do it in such a way that uh, addresses sort of our current and, and um, modern considerations. And so, uh, because globalization can be argued is happening very rapidly, and so displacement of industries can happen, and, and of jobs. And so there are considerations around the kind of education and training we need to have in place so that as there are shifts in the economic sectors, you know, folks are ready to enter new positions. And that also there are considerations around the impact of, on the environment as more and more nations adopt our industrialized way of living. And so we are actually using more of our limited resources faster. So there are other considerations around international trade now that were not considered then because of the nature of trade and the speed in, in which it is occurring. So this ends our part two of our, our wrap up. And uh, I thank you very much for listening. Please look uh, for part three. Thanks again.